Hi there, and welcome from Ventura, California, to today's webinar, Inertial and SLAM, Creating the Roadmap for Autonomous Vehicles, sponsored by Inside GNSS, Inside Unmanned Systems, and SBG Systems, and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. And in just a moment, we'll be introducing our panel of thought leaders, as today's webinar is about hearing from these experts as they address the topic at hand. Fully autonomous driving imposes many rigorous challenges on the navigation system, with safety and reliability foremost. Today, you'll hear from innovative engineers who have successfully addressed these challenges. You'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of the presentation during the Ask the Expert panel session with all three panel members. We've invited you, along with over 450 professionals from 45 countries, representing a variety of industries, and over the next 90 minutes, Regardless of your industry segment or your location, we're confident you'll find today's webinar of value. At this point, I would like to uh, introduce Richard Fisher, publisher inside GNSS, Insight Unmanned Systems, who would like to take just a moment to welcome you and introduce our main moderator for today's session. Richard? Thanks so much, Lori. Uh, on behalf of the Insight Unmanned Systems and Inside GNSS team, I extend a very warm welcome to our international audience for today's web seminar. We're absolutely delighted you could join us. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Alan Cameron, Editor-in-Chief of Inside GNSS Magazine and the PNT Editor for Inside Unmanned Systems. He's covered the GPS, GNSS, PNT, and UAS industries and research communities as a writer and a magazine editor since 2000, focusing on technical issues around continuous, reliable positioning and navigation. Alan, we're delighted to welcome you. Alan? Thank you very much, Richard, and welcome to everyone around the world. I see we have a truly international audience and uh, one spanning many of the uh, professional uh, job descriptions, job titles uh, in the industry. Today we're talking about one of the hottest topics, if not the hottest topic uh, in the PNT field, and that is combining integrating technologies. Uh, what do you do to keep your GNSS on track? Uh, and of course, the uh, two of the leading technologies in this category would be inertial and SLAM, simultaneous uh, localization and mapping. And our experts here are going today are going to give you a um, an in-depth dive into how they have combined these technologies to create uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, before we begin. I think we'll, uh, we'll, I'll just briefly introduce the panelists. I'll return to give you their uh, detailed bios when they start, but we are going to hear from Rafael Siriani uh, from SBG Systems covering inertial technology, Jérôme Nino from Via Metrice, who will talk about SLAM, and finally Pierre Lefebvre from Coast Autonomous, who will show you how these two are combined in a real world vehicle in it, that he has successfully fielded in several places around the world. Uh, before we get to the presentations, let's get to know the audience a little bit better, and we do that by uh, posing a poll question. Lori, there we go. Absolutely. Uh, coming up on your screen is that first poll, and we'd love to hear from each of you. Um, what is your status in autonomous vehicles, R&D, or product development? Okay, looks like we have 52% coming in with uh, in uh, early exploration, 23% in R&D phase looking for a localization solution, 18% in R&D phase and already have a localization solution, and 7% have an autonomous product already released. So, Alan, any thoughts there? Well, Lori, I think this is, uh, you couldn't ask for a better representation across these uh, four options. Uh, nearly half our audience is eager to learn. Uh, a quarter of them are uh, underway and are actively looking for the next piece of their puzzle. Uh, a fifth of them are, uh, are realizing something and we even have some who have a small 
portion, but perhaps they will chime in with uh, knowledgeable questions. Uh, I'm sure everyone will have knowledgeable questions, but uh, we'll get a, a great perspective because uh, some of our audience is already in the field with an autonomous product. All right, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Rafael Siriani, our first speaker. Rafael is a chief software architect and co-founder of inertial manufacturer SBG, a supplier of miniature high performance and innovative motion sensing solutions. He has a master's degree in embedded systems engineering from the Ecole Centrale d'Electronique. In the inertial field since 2006, he is in charge of embedded firmware designs, hardware designs, and MEMS sensor tests, characterization, and calibration at SBG Systems. For more than a decade, SBG Systems has designed and manufactured a complete line of inertial sensors based on state-of-the-art MEMS technology. And that includes attitude and heading reference systems, inertial measurement units, inertial navigation systems with embedded GPS, and more. Rafael can tell you more about his company and his technology. Uh, please, Rafael, go ahead. Thank you, Alan. Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome to this webinar. Uh, first of all, before I start, I would like to thank uh, uh, everybody that uh, has made this webinar possible, and uh, especially all the inside Genesis team, so thank you very much. And very quickly, I would like to introduce uh, SBG and uh, what we do. Uh, we are a full-scale manufacturer and provider of MEMS-based uh, IMU and INS, uh, starting with very small, uh, lightweight and uh, cost-effective solution to very high-end, fog-based, super-grade, uh, tightly coupled and post-process solution for the most demanding uh, HD map, for instance, sensoring, mobile mapping applications. So we cover full scale of applications. So now let's uh, talk and dive into uh, the topic of today. So first I would like to explain uh, what we call a safe and uh, reliable navigation solution. Then we will look a little bit more about uh, real-time tightly coupled INS uh, solution, how it works and what are the limitations and the benefits. Then uh, a very important topic will be protection level and reliability. How can we guarantee a, a, a position and an accuracy, mostly. Uh, I would like also to present some uh, real-life urban test results in very harsh environment. And finally, we will uh, quickly talk about how we can help uh, uh, HDMAP creation, mostly for SLAM-based algorithm. So, what we call a safe and uh, reliable navigation, uh, in fact, it's composed of several layers. Uh, the most obvious one will be the uh, relative one. Uh, with basically lane detection and vehicle spacing, so it's sort of starting uh, perception, uh, environment perception. Then uh, we will have SLAME uh, map matching based algorithm, so in this uh, type of algorithm we can achieve very accurate ac uh, position, but it's uh, mostly uh, relative information and uh, it's in, in uh, we can't in fact cover the whole earth uh, with this type of technology so it's uh, mostly used in very demanding areas and at the root the most important part uh, to get an absolute positioning information will be the genesis and ins uh, tightly coupled solution that uh, is uh, using also aiding information such, such as odometer or LiDAR or vision aiding information, both odometer based or uh, absolute positioning information. Uh, and Genesis INS is uh, the only solution that is really available ever, everywhere around the, the Earth. So if we look at uh, the pro and cons, uh, the relative uh, solutions are a completely isolated building block. So uh, if we look at certifications and safety, it's very important to make sure that uh, we try to isolate as much as possible each layer uh, and also to try to do some consistency checks. So for instance, relative algorithm can be helped by SLAM or Genesis information to make sure that all information are consistent. The SLAM and map matching algorithm are very accurate, but as I said, we have we need some uh, HD maps and up-to-date maps. And uh, if we feed uh, this algorithm with high-quality INS data, 
with uh, good uh, quality indicators, uh, we can enhance a lot of the reliability of the SLAM and map matching algorithm. And as you may know, we still have some corner cases to assess, such as how do we handle uh, very harsh uh, weather conditions uh, and uh, uh, how can we handle uh, changing environments and all that stuff. For the GNSS INS navigation is concerned, uh, it's quite easy to guarantee better than 10 centimeter accuracy in light urban and countryside. And if we are in very dense and harsh urban canyons, uh, today with MEMS based uh, INS with, uh, let's say, uh, consumer or automotive grade products, we can guarantee one to two meter accuracy even in very harsh conditions. It's the to topic of this uh, webinar, in fact. Uh, the GNSS uh, INS solution also requires very light infrastructure uh, from just base stations and even to almost no base station with PPP algorithm, of course. And it's also a very interesting uh, so source of information to get reliable quality indicators and protection levels. And it's also a topic I would like to cover in this uh, webinar. So before we dive into complicated stuff, let's start with the beginning. What is an INS? And uh, basically an INS integrate acceleration twice to get to position. And because this position will drift over time, we use absolute information, uh, mainly from GNSS, to correct for the position drift. Uh, of course, the absolute positioning accuracy will be driven by the GNSS only. And to be able to reach better than 10 centimeters, we will need a GNSS augmentation data. So it could come from ATK, and ATK will be perfect for those dense urban environments, and we'll uh, see why. And PPP will be much better if we are looking at uh, countryside, open sky condition with very last uh, area to cover. For INS uh, and GNSS coupled uh, solution, we have two types of algorithm, the loosely coupled one and the tightly coupled INS. Uh, loosely uh, coupling uh, is basically using uh, directly position and velocity information from a GNSS and fusing the GNSS position with the IMU data to get a corrected INS solution. And tightly coupling, uh, in fact, we just use the raw GNSS observables and we directly combine uh, those observables with the uh, IMU data in a unique uh, common filter that will directly compute both the attitude, the heading, as well as the position data in a one and single uh, algorithm. And we will, in this uh, webinar, focus on tightly coupling only and see why it's uh, very inter interesting for uh, autonomous and self-driving cars. So, at SBG, we have been working for one, more than 12 years on this specific topic, and we have designed a 100% in-house tightly coupled solution uh, for RTK, PPP, INS, that is uh, directly designed to support all constellations and all signals, and we will see that it's a very uh, important point to be able to guarantee uh, the reliability and quality in harsh environments. We also support any uh, GNSS manufacturers and mainly U-Block, Septentrion of Altel Tremble, so we can also support, as you see, uh, automotive grade GNSS uh, receivers. Uh, we have uh, integrated uh, support for ODBI uh, information from the car to get, for instance, wheel speed information. And our algorithm has been designed to ease uh, all uh, installation uh, and, for instance, be able to automatically estimate all misalignment, all lever arms and all this stuff, uh, and paired with advanced vehicle motion constraints, we can reach uh, outstanding accuracy in uh, very difficult conditions. And the last point, and for me it's one of the most important one, is that what we have designed is a full mature C library that is able to be integrated on any hardware and uh, is totally hardware agnostic. And this C library is used both in our Kinasha post-processing tool as well as in our, in our real-time products. And it's very, very important to be able to qualify, to evaluate, and to enhance and uh, improve the solution. So now let's talk about uh, protection level and reliability. So at SBG, we believe that uh, in uh, very difficult conditions today, 
ATK is still the best uh, algorithm to be able to achieve a very uh, accurate measurement with a good uh, confidence. So ATK uh, is the only algorithm that uh, allows very, very fast convergence time, uh, in the, uh, no convergence time at all. And in fact, when we look at uh, CLAs, uh, we see that uh, having a base station uh, or two base stations in a city is not so uh, so big deal. And it's uh, today the best way to uh, achieve very accurate positioning in dense environments. We also have PPP algorithm. And if you uh, use fixed PPP algorithm, we can get very good result uh, down to two centimeters to one half exactly. But we still need some convergence time. It's uh, down to one minute today, but still PPP algorithm are more sensitive to Genesis disturbances. Uh, and it's just because the filter has to estimate much more uh, observation and uh, estimate a lot of other stuff. So it makes the overall solution less uh, reliable and stable in very harsh environments. So today, for dense urban environments, uh, ATK is, uh, is much better than PPP, even if we believe that it could improve over time, but it's uh, today uh, state of the art. Then tightly coupling and RAIM. Very important to be able to uh, provide a very accurate uh, integrated test, uh, both in terms of GNSS data only and in terms of IMU coupled with the GNSS data. So because we have a tightly coupling algorithm, the IMU helps uh, compute and predict the exact vehicle position. And thanks to this vehicle position, we can constrain a lot the GNSS algorithm. Uh, to avoid bad ATK fixes, to improve ATK availability as well. Uh, our algorithm also use all constellations and all signals built in, so it's also improved a lot uh, when we are in very difficult environment because we have much more observables to uh, check which uh, signal is correct and which uh, signal is uh, in fact disturbed. If we look at the uh, well-known Stanford diagram, uh, we see that uh, the key information is not only the accuracy, the absolute accuracy, but to be able to qualify this accuracy, to say, OK, I have a 20 centimeter position, and I'm sure that I will be uh, at 20 centimeter, or maybe better, but not worse than 20 centimeter. And it's uh, most of, of the work we have done is on this specific topic, to be able to provide a position and a good quality indication of this position. Uh, today, RTK, uh, tightly coupled RTK algorithm are very, very uh, good at it, and we can have a very uh, useful uh, protection level indication, but it uh, require having a very good IMU modeling uh, because if uh, the IMU modeling is off, of course, you can create some non-modelized uh, non uh, uh, errors and it will decrease the PL accuracy. Uh, what is very interesting also is that we can continuously evaluate the IMU model to make sure that the IMU is still within the uh, specified bounds. Uh, so we can very easily detect in real time if the IMU is working as expected or not. And thanks to that, we can provide uh, also uh, some sort of built-in test and all that stuff. So if we look at real-life data, we see on this curve, uh, we have just uh, run uh, a car test in harsh environments and we plot the estimated uh, accuracy by the product uh, versus the true uh, error compared to a reference. And the idea is to be always above the red line, that is uh, the two sigma uh, errors. And we see that almost all points are built, uh, above this red line, meaning that the uh, INS algorithm is providing the position with an accuracy that are perfectly consistent. We still have to uh, improve and to uh, check in more conditions. Uh, but as we can see here, it's still providing very good and uh, consistent results. And we're talking about a very harsh environment using a MEMS-based INS. As I said, it's very important to uh, know the IMU and have a good IMU model. So 
in fact we will need a sort of calibration or a sort of screening on the IMU itself I don't I'm not talking about high accuracy IMU calibration I'm just uh, saying that we will have to uh, check at least that the IMU is uh, reaching the expected level of accuracy uh, and in this field we have a huge expertise because we uh, calibrate thousands of MEMS IMU uh, per year. Uh, we also provide uh, military grade IMUs that has uh, very harsh conditions. So for us having an IMU that uh, can comply to uh, certain specifications is mandatory to be able to provide a certified navigation solution. So we use a tool, uh, Kinersha, that is our in-house post-processing tool to assess the real-time uh, quality of the solution and uh, in fact post-processing is basically playing the data forward, you, so you see in the red uh, curve on the right, as well as backward and then merging the data to be able to provide the most accurate uh, solution available. So we use a fog-based unit with post-processing to get a reference trajectory and then we will compare this trajectory with a real-time tactical solution and see how the system behaves. We can also with Kenosha uh, replay a lot of different scenarios such as removing the odometer, injecting some disturbances to see how the whole solution behaves and with a lot of consistency check and all this stuff. So it's a very interesting tool to assess uh, the quality of a solution. So now let's talk, talk about a real life application. We have tried to pick up very harsh conditions and in, in this uh, example for instance we uh, have a log with a lot of underground tunnels with very few uh, uh, parts uh, with uh, GNSS availability. We also have a full area in harsh environment with a lot of tall buildings, with a lot of glasses and all this stuff. It's a nightmare for GNSS. And the idea is to see how the system behaves. Uh, we provide in real time ATK correction through a uh, standard cellular network. So it's quite, let's say, um, classical uh, test conditions that we can have in self driving cars. So on this uh, video, we see uh, directly Kinasha output for uh, displaying the real-time tightly coupled uh, solution. And we see in yellow dots all the GNSS itself that is receiving RTK correction in real time, but is not able to provide RTK because it's too uh, difficult conditions. However, we see in white uh, the, the INS solution, the tightly coupled INS solution, but it's still providing uh, sometimes RTK fixes uh, and also providing all the time a solution that is below 60 centimeters. And uh, what is the most important point here is that we see that the GNSS itself uh, is not able to correctly report the standard deviation. We see that the GNSS could report for instance 12 meters of uh, estimated error whereas in fact it's more than 100 meters but for the INS uh, we see uh, a very consistent uh, reporting between the actual accuracy and the reported one here for instance we just stop and we see that the GNSS is completely off and report very accurate measurements down to one meter but instead it's completely off. So this situation is really dangerous and it's why you absolutely need a tightly coupled INS GNSS solution and not only a GNSS itself. We also run the test uh, in very long uh, tunnels. Uh, so for instance here, all the blue line you see are uh, using odometer and INS only, no GNSS data at all. And uh, we have, for instance, a tunnel of six kilometers long, 33 seconds. And if we look at the exit of the tunnel, we will see how the INS will uh, realign to the uh, GNSS solution and the, G, the INS is uh, delivering uh, an estimated accuracy of 2.5 uh, meters but in fact as you can see uh, we were below 2.3 meters so we see that it's perfectly in line uh, between what the unit is expecting to have and the actual error so it's also very interesting to aid SLAM algorithm in underground to help the SLAM algorithm uh, work uh, correctly.
So finally, uh, we also provide full product range uh, to uh, ease uh, HD map creation. So the idea is to be able to, uh, to, to map a large area with a high level of efficiency because you have to continuously also update the HD maps uh, and we provide a full-scale solution uh, with a nice nav site integration from very high-end fog-based units uh, down to uh, Equinox for less demanding situation and Apogee that could uh, fulfill most applications in fact. Kinersha, as I said, is our post processing software and uh, we can achieve very fast workflow and the best uh, available accuracy on the market. Uh, for instance, with a fog unit, uh, we can do go down to uh, 0.002 degrees of uh, roll pitch and better than 0.007 degrees on heating. Uh, so it's uh, quite uh, amazing accuracies. And of course, it's open to any uh, Genesis manufacturers or IMU and all that stuff. So it's a very, very uh, interesting tool. We still have, we, we have already addressed a lot of issues, but we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, for instance, uh, we would like to increase uh, our uh, test database for low-cost Genesis IMU as well. Uh, we will also work, uh, we are working uh, currently with, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Jérôme on uh, aiding the INS alignment with vision and LIDAR information. Uh, we also would like to uh, dive into the SLAM when we are in private parking lots and underground situation. Maybe we, would, we can also use uh, visual or radio-based beacons for some uh, situation where SLAM will fail. And of course, we uh, are continuing to improve uh, the quality and production level we can uh, return, return from the product and be sure that we can evaluate all situations such, such as drifting, if it's icy conditions and all that stuff. So very, uh, still a lot of work to do, but we already did a, a good job. So thank you everybody and back to you, Alan. Thank you very much, Rafael. You alluded to Jérôme in your last uh, slide, and of course we see him here, and I'm going to introduce him in just a moment. First, I want to let the audience know that we are going to pause halfway through Jérôme's uh, presentation, which is approximately the halfway point of the webinar. Uh, we'll, we'll have some question and answer interaction with our panelists and a further poll question uh, to the audience, and then we'll return and Jérôme will resume his uh, presentation. Uh, all right, next up, Jérôme Nino, Mapping Chief and Founder of Viametris, started his career working on image processing applied to autonomous vehicles after graduating as an engineer with a master's degree. He attended the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, that's DARPA's, Grand Challenge and Urban Challenge in 2005 and 2007, and he was responsible in these uh, for, for perception uh, department uh, for a robotic French company in a vehicle that participated in these uh, challenges. He started a PhD thesis with Telecom Bretagne on automatic road features recognition by image processing, uh, which he successfully defended in 2011. While completing his uh, academic thesis, he created Viametris in 2007. As an inventor and researcher, he developed a mobile mapping system in 2008 and invented the first SLAM-based mobile scanning system dedicated to indoor areas in 2011. He assembled a solid research team, still working with him nowadays, to develop a range of innovative products in order to develop the future of mobile scanning. And during the last five years, Fiametris has created a unique hybrid INS GNSS six degrees of freedom slam product and range of scanners. Jérôme, you are introduced and now for your presentation. Thank you, Alan. Uh, everybody to, uh, thank you everybody to, to attend this webinar. I, I, I think it, it will be uh, rich for you. Um, I'm Jérôme Nino and I'm CEO of Viametris, a company uh, specialized in mobile mapping technology. Uh, we developed and assembled various mobile scanners, uh, such uh, systems on vehicle and also backpack solutions. Um, I will first 
um, explain you the, the principle of SLAM, um, basically. Then I'll show you uh, two, method, two methods of merging together INS and SLAM. Uh, then after a short pause uh, for questions, uh, I will show you some results and application for autonomous shuttles. Uh, uh, first of all, SLAM means simultaneous localization and mapping. Uh, that's a, a family of algorithms developed initially for uh, rovers and mobile mapping and, and mobile robotics in order to map unknown areas and uh, to give the ability to come back to the starting point. Uh, there, there are uh, four main steps. Uh, the first one is uh, the landmark extraction. Uh, then uh, there is a, the, the current pose estimation uh, where we can have a landmark matching and from the landmark matching we can update the pose and update the map uh, in order to construct and build this uh, map of landmarks. Um, so Main, main points regarding the specificities of the SLAM. Uh, SLAM provide relative positioning uh, with respect to the 0, 0, 0, the, the initial point. Um, the orientation has absolutely no reference as well uh, because we are just dealing with uh, perception sensors. And natively, the reference coordinate system is a metric. Uh, so those two videos deal with different approaches. One is LiDAR-based SLAM, while the, the second one is a vision-based SLAM, where you can see in, in both uh, a lot of landmarks, so yeah, it's actually more visible in the second one uh, for the vision SLAM because the, the camera display the, the landmarks that are exploited uh, to uh, deduce the movement. Uh, so to, uh, to uh, summarize, uh, uh, SLAM can be identified uh, as a, a high-grade DMI, uh, distance measurement instrument, providing movement estimation in three axes. Um, but SLAM is also able to have a large point of view of, by considering a large-scale landmarks knowledge database. Uh, this is called loop closure step, and this part of the algorithm uh, minimizes large-scale drift uh, because of this accumulation of small error. The, this uh, large scale can be reduced by loop closure. Um, so now, uh, co coupling INS and SLAM uh, is then not of use at all for two main reasons. Uh, the first one, INS and SLAM are not working in the same coordinate frame. Uh, one is in relative and the other is in absolute coordinates. And secondly, we, if we want to couple different sources of sensors, we need to be able to calibrate them in the same body frame. So that's uh, the, the second uh, uh, issue to, to handle when we want to uh, merge and couple SLAM and INS. Uh, so now we, we solved those two constraints. Uh, we propose the, this first simple coupling uh, method we are using in Viametris by just using the attitude reference uh, of the INS in order to provide a corrected SLAM trajectory re regarding the horizontal plan. Uh, the second advantage is the fact that we can output six degrees of freedom trajectory interpolated at 200 hertz by using the INS data rate. Uh, and of course, we can go further than to obtain the trajectory in the absolute coordinates frame by including GNSS position as global constraints in the computation. But uh, actually, uh, this uh, this is, however, GNSS is not always available, so uh, that's why the first merging method, this one, uh, will be selected for indoor area, for indoor mapping, for autonomous wheelchairs or shuttles, 
in buildings or in the very deep urban canyons where GNSS is uh, uh, not usable at all. Um, you have in, in those two pictures some example of where we can use uh, this, uh, this methodology. The, the second one we propose is, uh, is, is called a true heading slam. Actually, we, we called it like that because when we developed it, we, we, we thought that it could be a, a good representation of, of, of what it does. That this method can be used while we have a low dynamic shutters, for instance, while uh, GNSS reception is not good enough to maintain GNSS trading with two antenna. Um, shuttles will probably need to stop quite often at bus stop or for pedestrian avoidance, for example. So that, that's also another uh, reason to use this true heading SLAM. And in that case, we introduce SLAM heading uh, data to overcome and to keep robust and steady heading, which is highly critical for INS to compute a proper trajectory. Um, so just to explain uh, um, what, what, what it represents, this principle. So first of all, we compute a SLAM trajectory <coughs> uh, in local coordinate system. Uh, SLAM trajectory is then globally oriented with respect to the north using GNSS position. And then we can uh, use the SLAM orientation around the, the z-axis uh, to introduce uh, it in the, in the INS as a true heading information. Uh, the SLAM will then uh, maintain the true heading all along the time. Uh, and next, GNSS rece reception uh, with, with uh, open sky area, for example, will be used to update the, the heading of the body uh, in the system. So we have then uh, two separated situation. Uh, first one, while we are uh, mapping, the, the true heading SLAM is computed using GNSS, as I explained before. Uh, those GNSS points and the trajectory will be output in post-processing using PPK capabilities. So for example, using uh, Kinertia that uh, Raphael explained just before. And the second case, uh, which will be used for uh, um, a real-time application, like uh, uh, autonomous vehicle or autonomous shuttles, uh, the second situation is when we are in a, in a shuttle positioning mode, the GNSS can be switched off, and the global orientation can be provided by map matching uh, algorithm. So this method results in a very robust trajectory computation highly independent from GNSS outages, especially if the INS has additional headings, such as a, a DMI, a, a distance measurement instrument, uh, so that you cover uh, the, the full needs of the INS by providing speed information and a, a true heading based on the, the local map we have in database. So, uh, Back to you, Alan, for this uh, first uh, uh, set of questions. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, our first question coming in is, I'm going to pose it first to Raphael, uh, but uh, after he answers, uh, Jerome and Pierre, if you have anything to add, please feel free to jump in. And the question is, of course, the uh, again, one of the hottest topics in, in our PNT environment, how do you handle GNSS jamming? Uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, so, in fact, uh, GNSS uh, jamming or spoofing uh, is handled uh, using three different uh, methods. The first one will be really at the GNSS level. Uh, it's uh, mainly uh, signal, uh, signal processing. Uh, and uh, on this specific topic, uh, there is a lot of uh, specific uh, solutions such as uh, notch filter, anti-jamming, and all this stuff at the signal level. It's not uh, this one or core competence, it's more on the GNSS manufacturer itself. But then we have two other uh, building blocks that uh, helps the uh, jamming and spoofing uh, detection. 
Uh, because uh, we used uh, IMU data, uh, we have a very uh, uh, fine-tuned uh, algorithm to be able to detect any uh, discrepancy between uh, the IMU data as well as the Genesis data. And in fact, uh, we apply both a RAIM algorithm, very advanced RAIM algorithm, uh, to uh, try to work only on the Genesis signals themselves to try to discard as much as possible uh, jammed uh, data, but also uh, we then work uh, more on the tightly coupling uh, side and make sure that we always have a consistency between uh, the predicted position from the INS and the uh, uh, Genesis signals, in fact. And on this topic, we are very good at it. Uh, it's because uh, on the tightly coupling solution, uh, we were able to correctly uh, modelize the IMU uh, and just the position drift of the time uh, to be sure that we have a very, very well uh, and fine-tuned system. And thanks to that, uh, we can uh, obtain amazing results when we have both jamming, multipath, and spoofing, of course. Thank you, Raphael. Uh, Jerome and Pierre, do you have anything to add to that before we go to the next question? That, that's quite well expressed by uh, Raphael. Okay. Uh, uh, and just to add a little bit, uh, we also uh, use uh, different adding information uh, such as the odometer, the uh, vision or lidar based odometer information, uh, and it also helps the system to be sure uh, that the genesis is providing consistent results as well. All right. I'm going to squeeze in one more question for you, Rafael, uh, before we go to the polling question. And that is, how can you detect if the INS is healthy or has a hardware defect? Uh, if we talk about safety, obviously, this uh, is a very important topic. Uh, so we uh, have uh, several ways to do it. First of all, we have a built-in test at the IMU level for each uh, component. Then we have also developed uh, some specific uh, uh, detection uh, using several IMUs uh, in the same uh, unit, in fact, and to be able to make sure that all IMUs are uh, providing consistent results. And then the most important point is that uh, the Kalman filter, the tightly coupled solution, is continuously monitoring uh, the IMU uh, data uh, as we always estimate all the IMU errors so we check that all these errors are within uh, the specified bounds and thanks to that we can very easily uh, detect if the IMU is working as expected or not and uh, update uh, protection level consistently. Very succinct. Uh, Jérôme or Pierre anything to add to that? No. All right. Uh, Laurie, let's go to our next polling question, please. All right. Uh, on the screen there, in your opinion, uh, which localization technology is the most important to achieve certified autonomous driving? Looks like we have 30% uh, coming in with vision-based SLAM, 24% LiDAR-based SLAM, 42% inertial plus GNSS, and 5% beacons. Um, Alan? Well, I, I know why it took a while for the audience to answer uh, or to make up their minds because this was a bit of an unfair question. Uh, it, when we, or the fact that we asked you to choose only one of these options because in fact uh, inertial plus GNSS, which is the leading candidate here as we see, uh, still needs a little help. And, uh, but to say that uh, LiDAR-based SLAM alone or, or vision-based SLAM alone could do the job is perhaps uh, asking a bit much. Uh, lesson learned, uh, beacons of course, uh, uh, first thought to be uh, important and, and certainly important for um, for human drivers are, are fading away in terms of uh, developing autonomous driving. Uh, lesson learned, we need a little bit of everything, or we need a lot of everything to make autonomous driving work. Uh, Jérôme, let's uh, resume with your presentation, please.
Thank you. Um, so now I will uh, present some examples. The project you have here on on the screen, uh, uh, it, it's a project we 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 had to to be able to produce a HD map uh, in an uh, industrial area. Uh, we met, uh, of course, GNSS outages uh, in in between buildings 18 meters tall and narrow corridors five meters wide. So that's that was quite challenging. Uh, moreover, we were not allowed to go at high speed, so we made it walking at one meter per second. Then, thanks to the, the trading slam, the INS keep correct uh, trajectory in GNSS outages area. Uh, the, the INS keep full navigation mode as well, thanks to the, the trading uh, computation. Uh, we have been using uh, land surveyor ground control points in order to qualify the result, and, and we, we, we were able to prove that we obtained a global error uh, less than 5 centimeters on more than 25 control points, so that, that was quite successful for, for this project. Um, the second uh, illustration of, of, the, of the application we have uh, for this uh, development, now I can show you the some final data dedicated to autonomous shuttles. Uh, HD roadmap is what we use to gather various kind of data such, such as a landmarks database for map matching, uh, geographical information such speed limit and traffic light positions, and cautious area like road crossing marking. Uh, this amount of data is uh, geolocalized and we try to put as much as as much data as possible to modelize the road and to have a complete knowledge of the network uh, in order to adapt the behavior of shuttles. So that's really uh, a starting point for, for uh, uh, efficient uh, uh, shuttles. Um, finally, this slide is just uh, to illustrate the, the map matching algorithm we developed. Uh, that's uh, uh, dedicated to GNSS denied area in order to keep global positioning in any circumstances. Uh, blue points you can see in, in this video uh, are landmarks, so they are uh, initially uh, tiled in, in, a, in a full uh, geographic database. Uh, and red or light blue points are the real-time uh, laser data uh, that match to the deduce to, to deduce absolute position and orientation and what you are seeing here is absolutely without GNSS at all uh, because of the, the, the area here was uh, really difficult to maintain uh, a, a GNSS all along the time so uh, we we preferred to use only a map matching principle to make sure that the localization of the, the rover and the shuttle is uh, consistent and robust. So now uh, back to you, Alan. Thank you very much, Jérôme. Uh, we'll go now to our third panelist, who is uh, Pierre Lefebvre, Chief Technical Officer of Coast Autonomous, uh, highly experienced in robotics, 3D mapping, and autonomous vehicles with several firsts to his credit. As a consultant to governmental rulemaking authorities, commercial vehicle manufacturers, and technology companies, and the academic community, Pierre leads a team developing highly accurate indoor and outdoor 3D mapping, commercial-ready vehicle automation, and remote supervision systems on various vehicle platforms focusing on urban mobility solutions. And he's going to display uh, some very interesting uh, results, uh, successful results in that regard. In, uh, in 2017, Pierre delivered the first autonomous shuttle to Hong Kong, and in 2018, demonstrated the first autonomous vehicle, the P1, on Broadway in the heart of New York's Times Square, and that's what we'll see very shortly. Pierre, uh, let's see your, uh, your work. Thank you, Alan. So let me tell you a little bit what we uh, are doing at Coast Autonomous. So first, Coast means uh, Connected Autonomous Shared Transportation. 
and we are really focusing on, on the last mile mobility and we develop vehicle to move people inside the city so we are very uh, different from standard autonomous private cars uh, that you can hear about uh, in this world. Um, the, the first idea was that um, most people live in city now and um, uh, we, we do not live in space as we would do uh, when I was young. We now live uh, in time means uh, um, you can live inside the city and work in another city or anywhere in the world and the cities are becoming much more vertical than they were before. So that means that you cannot afford to have vehicle for everybody um, and the relationship with uh, personal transportation is changing a lot, not to speak about uh, new climate uh, awareness. So what happens is um, even American people are uh, spending much less time in their car. Uh, young people are not uh, very interested in owning a car or having a driver license. Uh, another point is uh, 1.5 million American people will uh, turn 65 every year from now. And most of, most of these people do not want to stay in their big suburb houses and they don't want to drive anymore, so they want to be in walkable city, means that more vertical city and cities where you can uh, go for a dinner, um, an event, uh, without taking a private car. So that's uh, why we develop uh, autonomous vehicle. Um, and, and the first question we had was, uh, do we need to build cities for cars or for people? And our answer is that it should be for people. Um, and our, our real job is uh, to give back the city to people, not to cars. And uh, as such, provide uh, mobility solutions. So what's the solution? The solution is what we call the P1. Uh, by the way, the, the vehicle itself uh, uh, doesn't matter so much. Uh, we consider it a, a type of horizontal elevator, uh, but it has to work inside the city, uh, indoor, outdoor, under trees canopy. That's why we went to uh, New York Broadway, uh, because as Raphael and Jerome explained it, it's a very difficult area for GNSS and uh, it was a very good test for our different uh, localization layers. So we, we focus on a, a few principles, safety first, and we can because uh, we are in a low dynamic, we can stop if we are in trouble. Uh, we will always prevail on safety of um, pedestrian and passenger rather than speed. Uh, we do not depend on GNSS, we are completely people-centric, uh, both for the service and for safety. And we wanted to have a vehicle uh, financially affordable and uh, available as soon as possible. And for all these reasons, the localization for us is absolutely mandatory. Um, here you have an example of uh, a 3D map that we did uh, in July for the Formula E uh, Grand Prix, uh, where we had to uh, interview a few uh, former pilots in our golf cart. So we did the first uh, um, 3D map uh, with Viametris uh, system, and, and then we used the, the result of the map in our localization system to travel the track. Another, another example here is under canopy, it's uh, University of uh, uh, South Florida in Tampa. You can see the shuttle is trying to overtake a pedestrian who do not care at all about what's going on behind. Uh, but again, the localization 
is mostly not using GNSS there. Uh, it's using one of the seven layers of uh, localization that we have. So we use, uh, of course, GNSS. Uh, we use an SBG Ellipse uh, 2D. Uh, we have odometry uh, for dead reckoning. We have uh, map matching, 2D LiDAR SLAM, 3D LiDAR SLAM, and optical. And each one has a confidence index, um, which is dynamically evaluated. And you will see later on, on different use cases, how it can be used. Like in a fully desertic area, uh, we, of course, use uh, GNSS. But in an airport indoor, we would mostly map match and uh, use a SLAM. Uh, same thing in the urban canyon. Um, and depending on the different areas, uh, we would use different layers of uh, localization. That being said, uh, each one of the layers is able to completely uh, manage the autonomous driving of the vehicle. So, it, of course, this applies to uh, city centers, but also universities, airports, ports, and uh, you can imagine uh, a lot of different uh, city center-like uh, areas, at least like my less mile uh, mobility areas. So one of the, the application we are currently developing is for the Southeast Asian game, it's a type of uh, Olympic games for the Southeast Asia, for uh, 660 million people there. So you see the a new city being built. Um, in Philippines, Traffic is uh, a real trouble, so uh, one of the, their solution is to build a brand new city that they call Nuclear City, and that's where uh, the Southeast Asian game will happen in December. We will move uh, athletes from the Olympic Village to the different stadiums there. Also very interesting for localization matter. Um, this one is um, a rail port. Um, I think with, with this you will understand the difficulty of localization and what is absolutely needed in a vehicle where there is no operator at all. So this is a rail port in south of Texas. Um, you can see that we have to drive um, in a kind of canyon of trains, metallic trains, and you have to imagine that trains can move. Uh, just to tell you how localization is uh, complex, because GNSS is not so good in this area. Um, we, we don't have um, 3G access, no communication, uh, no marking lanes, uh, and uh, very few infrastructure around for map matching. So that's a very challenging um, area for localization, and we provide there uh, people transportation as well as good transportation over the rail port. And finally, we are working on uh, um, Orlando University, uh, 68,000 students plus faculty. Um, you probably know that in the US, the main problem for university is parking of cars uh, before um, uh, teaching. Um, so we, again, we are under trees. We don't want to cut trees. Uh, we are on the mixed traffic and pedestrian area to move people in the best conditions. So this was uh, a few examples. Um, uh, of how we apply uh, the multi layers that uh, both SBG and geometries describe in their technical presentation. Back to you, Alan. Thank you very much, Pierre. It's it's so exciting to see that uh, shuttle in in uh, Times Square and in Central Florida. Uh, these these technologies are are becoming real. While well, they are real, they're they're they are coming out into the world and people are experiencing them and the interaction between the shuttle and that pedestrian was was really uh, 
I guess exciting is the wrong word for it, but uh, il illuminating just to see how these systems, how intelligent these systems are. Uh, we are going to uh, first show the audience how you can find out more about each of these uh, uh, companies or, or about SBG systems, I should say. Uh, SBG will be exhibiting at uh, Expo 2019 in Michigan and Singapore 2019, the ITS World Congress, of course, a, a huge show uh, every year, and at 2020 CES, which I believe is in Las Vegas. Uh, you can find out more. Please, please go by and please mention that you heard about them through this webinar. Uh, Lori, let's go now to the poll question, the third poll question for our audience. Absolutely. Um, coming up on your screen is that third and final poll question on which autonomous vehicle segment do you mainly focus? So is it public transportation, autonomous shuttles, trucks and fleets, driverless cars, mine and construction, agriculture? Looking like 11% public transportation, 8% trucks and fleets, 56% driverless cars, 9% mine and construction, 16% agriculture. Uh, any thoughts there, Alan? Yes, uh, of course, all the attention, uh, most of the attention, I should say, the public attention is on driverless cars. But I will uh, hazard a guess and make a prediction that this will not be the first segment to really reach full implementation uh, out in the world. Uh, we, we've been doing some research here at, at Inside GNSS and Inside Unmanned Systems, and we have perhaps another answer to make, but I'll leave that for another time. It's interesting to see that uh, other areas are uh, are developing and are, are seen uh, as promising by the, the people in our audience, uh, but again, driverless cars is getting most of the attention. We'll see how that, that pans out. Uh, we are going to go now to a question. I'm going to turn back to Pierre again and ask you, uh, ask you, Pierre, um, in in coast autonomous uh, view, how do you see the how do you see the evolution of this market uh, for autonomous vehicles developing? Yes, Alan, I am afraid I will go a bit uh, against uh, our audience there, but I, I really believe um, that the, the main need is inside the city and in suburban. So um, uh, I really consider that the market will be in different uh, type of uh, vehicle, um, small, small to bigger, uh, up to robot taxi. But I, I don't believe at all in uh, completely autonomous private cars uh, because honestly by the time uh, it gets at a decent price and efficiency on the market uh, we should mostly live in cities in vertical cities and fly from one city to the other um, so I, I know it may be uh, much less cars, and I think it's needed to have much less cars just because we cannot st stack them in, in the cities, and uh, uh, but much more mobility. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how we see the market, and we really believe that uh, uh, people-friendly transportation system uh, will be a big part of, of the market. Thank you, Pierre. Raphael and Jerome, do you do you wish to uh, propose views that uh, may align with those of the audience, or perhaps we be different in terms of the development of the autonomous vehicle market? Uh, just very, very quick insight. I, I do believe that uh, on a technical point of view, uh, it will be probably easier and more practical to start with uh, autonomous shuttle, uh, maybe public transportation then, uh, big trucks and uh, all the stuff before we can move forward the uh, self-driving car itself. That is, in my opinion, uh, the most uh, difficult uh, uh, solution to, to achieve, in fact. Jerome, anything to add to that before we go to the next question? 
Yeah, maybe just a, a remark regarding the private cars. The, the, we will have more and more assistance and, and technology embedded in the vehicle. But yeah, I, I pretty agree that our cars will not drive alone uh, in the next 10 years for sure. Yes, it's a, it's a problematic in, in technology as well as in the public perception, but we are, we are moving forward. I'm going to come back to you, Jerome, with another question, particular uh, uh, to the, um, well, it, to Jerome and Raphael, uh, both. Uh, one member of the audience says that, uh, I think I heard that each IMU needs to be characterized before use. If so, do the parameters then get plugged in to the integration algorithm? So, yeah, um, for, my, for my part and my point of view, um, uh, we don't integrate the, the IMU characterization uh, and all the calibration that that is done uh, in SBG systems, for example, we just make sure that uh, when we calibrate, so on our side, calibration means a physical calibration to, to know the lever arms and the, the bias be, between sensors. Uh, and for that, we are making sure that we work after uh, some warming up time to have a, a proper uh, a, a sensor and they are working in their perfect uh, perfect time let's say that like that uh, but we don't integrate the characterization of the IMU. okay so uh, I would try to both answer this question and maybe another question at the same time that uh, is more uh, focusing on which parameters uh, we have to calibrate uh, to achieve autonomous uh, vehicle uh, in terms of IMU. So uh, first of all, uh, in fact, we calibrate the IMU to be able to guarantee that the IMU will uh, reach a defined specification level. So of course, each IMU that is calibrated will have its own uh, model implanted in the IMU. Uh, it's mainly the calibration process itself. But on the common filter side, we don't uh, use uh, specific parameters for each single IMU. In fact, what we do is to try to calibrate IMUs and then qualify IMUs as best as possible to be able to say, OK, all the IMUs I will produce will at least reach this level of accuracy. So in fact, we are looking at uh, the maximum errors in uh, several conditions, such as in vibrations in, over, over time, long-term long stability. Uh, and uh, then we can say in the common filter, we know that all our IMUs will be better or at least as good as uh, specific settings. And this is the only way to be able to guarantee that the reported accuracy and all the protection levels are consistent. So in fact, most of the time, uh, the IMU will be better than the uh, IMU error models we put in the common filter. Uh, and it's the only way to guarantee a high level of integrity and certifications. So because we have also uh, military applications, uh, we have a quite huge uh, understanding on these requirements and we know on MEMS IMU how to uh, qualify the long-term stability, the environment stability of, the, of the IMU. So if we look at uh, the parameters, the main parameters we have to calibrate on an IMU, in fact it really depends on the uh, MEMS sensor uh, you are using because some are very good at some parameters and some are very bad and for instance uh, we have seen some uh, on-the-shelf MEMS component that, in fact, doesn't uh, require uh, temperature uh, calibration, but just uh, room temperature calibration because they are quite stable in terms of uh, thermal uh, behavior. On the other hand, we also see uh, some sort that have very huge drift uh, in uh, thermal drift, in fact, and it's mandatory to calibrate them. So it's it's a really uh, hard and tough job to 
uh, select the co correct MEMS component and then to calibrate the MEMS component correctly. But something I would like to emphasize on that it's a very um, important to not say the Kalman filter will estimate everything and all IMU's parameters because if for instance you say I don't want to calibrate the IMU at all and let the Kalman filter estimate the scale factor of the orthogonality for instance as well as the bias and all the stuff uh, with large errors uh, it ends up with a solution that is not uh, very uh, reliable and repeatable because you have too much states to estimate in the common filter and it's a dangerous situation so as I said the most important stuff is to be able to uh, guarantee that all IMUs will reach a certain uh, performance level and at SBG, depending on the accuracy we're looking at, we calibrate all parameters such as the linearity of accelerometers, the gyroscopes, the cross-axis, intermal and all this stuff. But for lower cost IMUs that can be used in automotive grade application, for instance, uh, it, just a room top outer calibration could be enough if you have uh, picked up the correct MEMS component, of course. All right. Thank you. Uh, question for Raphael. Is there an interface or plans for one in SBG's INS GNSS solutions to influence internal Kalman or Kalman-like filters from outside? So in fact we use Kinarsha as a LED development hub as well uh, because we can very easily tune some internal parameters and also change uh, rejections and say I would like to use this adding sensor or don't use it at all. So mainly it will be this. It, uh, we will uh, quite easily uh, evaluate the behavior of INS system if we lost the odometer aiding, for instance, and if we inject some uh, GNSS uh, disturbances or odometer disturbances, uh, but you can't uh, change the Kalman filter itself. However, you can uh, define your own IMU model uh, and uh, run the algorithm and evaluate the behavior using several uh, IMU models parameters but it's more just the IMU model, not the Kalman filter itself, because it's way, uh, it's in fact a very complicated job, uh, and it's uh, even us, uh, we spend a lot of time to find the correct parameters, so clearly it's not something uh, that we can easily open up to uh, third party and customers. But of course, uh, as I said, our uh, C library is fully, uh, customizable in fact and we have what we call uh, specific motion profiles for each type of applications and scenarios and we can set up and tune a lot of parameters in these motion profiles so if you have a specific application uh, of course we will be here to help you find the correct motion profile or even tune it to adapt to your specific application thank you uh, Pierre and uh, Raphael, perhaps you want to uh, collaborate on the answer to the next question uh, or each contribute your viewpoints. Uh, what are the requirements in, in terms of numbers of calibration parameters such as bias, offset, scale factor and so on in IMUs uh, when uh, used for autonomous vehicles? So I've tried to uh, partially answer that uh, with my previous sensor, but uh, mainly uh, it will depend on how you use the IMU because as I said, uh, the most important point is to qualify the IMU quality. And it, in terms of number, uh, out of the box it doesn't mean nothing because it really depends on the conditions you will be using the system. It's If it's a uh, private car, it's not the same as if you are using it on a military uh, ground vehicle that uh, will sustain uh, vibrations as well as heat and uh, shocks and all that stuff. Uh, so we have, as I said, a deep uh, experience uh, for all the scenarios, uh, but clearly what we see today is that we were able to uh, validate our algorithm using uh, IMUs that we have designed that are completely in line with a uh, uh, huge market, mass market and automotive uh, grade uh, requirements. 
So I do believe that uh, the IMU itself, if it's correctly designed, correctly evaluated and correctly calibrated, uh, today is ready for uh, self-driving cars. Pierre, anything to add to that in terms of your I installation aboard your shuttles? No, no, not, not really. I think uh, Raphael did answer completely. Okay, a complete answer. Uh, Jérôme, a couple of questions for you now. Uh, one, does weather affect the SLAM algorithm in any way? Um, I, no, I would not say that. Uh, the, for example, if we have rains, you will have uh, a noisy result uh, in terms of um, landmarks. So when you are matching them and when you track them, uh, that just an, a, a part of the noise you, the algorithm needs to handle. Uh, so just to keep the robustness of the results. Um, and on the other end, you have uh, uh, for a, a changing environment, like um, uh, if you have a lot of uh, snow, for example, it, you will have a result. But in that case, it's more an issue on, on the uh, mapping uh, area. I mean that your, your uh, uh, HD map changed if you have a lot of snow uh, two months later. So actually you need to update the map uh, to make sure that you can apply again a uh, map matching algorithm, for example. So it's more uh, uh, a concern for usage of the technology, but not a limit due to the condition and the weather condition. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one more for you, Jerome. Uh, it was briefly uh, covered or alluded to during the presentations, but can you just return to the subject of uh, LiDAR-based SLAM versus vision-based SLAM? How, uh, what are the advantages, the relative advantages of, of each? So, um, basically, uh, LiDAR, as uh, everybody knows, the LiDAR works on the, the light, uh, the light returns and the time of flight of the light to uh, estimate distances. And uh, vision will just uh, uh, use light of, of the environment to, to, to have a picture. So the limit of every uh, technique uh, will depend on the area and the environment. Uh, if you are in a, a very uh, high structural environment like uh, buildings and poles and etc., uh, LiDAR based LAM will work perfectly um, because you have a lot of features and a lot of landmarks to, to uh, feed the algorithm. Um, on the other end, image will be also very useful uh, vision-based SLAM, for, so using image will be very useful uh, if you need to exploit also the contrast, uh, like uh, uh, different uh, uh, paintings or uh, road markings, etc. So if, if you need to work in a very uh, low level of features, you will prefer using vision-based SLAM. All right, thank you. I'm going to ask all of our panelists to contribute an answer to this final question, and we have about four minutes left, so that's one minute per panelist. And I'm going to rephrase the question slightly as it came in. Um, someone wants to know, is this statement right? More sensors, uh, is this better? that uh, do we get a better result, a more reliable and robust result uh, with more sensors? I'm going to tag on to that. Is there a point of diminishing returns when, uh, if, if after which adding more sensors just does not um, create extra advantage or maybe creates difficulty? Pierre, let's hear from you first, and then we'll go to Jerome and Raphael to close out. Okay, um, 
I, I, I don't I don't know uh, don't see a, a physical limit to the number of sensors. Um, that being said, um, we we are not doing a, a pure research. We are uh, working to provide a service. Uh, with autonomous vehicle right now, so we need to have as less sensor as we can, but still we need to be completely redundant, at least twice, in terms of technology, uh, range, and field of view. Um, and and we, we, we don't want to have a, a, a full trunk of computers, so um, our purpose is really to have an efficient solution, but always be redundant in terms of technology, at least. So we would use, we use LIDARs, but we also use cameras. Uh, and for the same thing, uh, just to be sure that we have some redundancy when the LIDAR are denied, uh, that the camera will be efficient, and uh, etc. But we, we won't put uh, uh, 15 or 20 LIDARs uh, around the vehicle just because then we, we, don't, we have no chance to be commercially uh, on the market. Exactly. Cost is always a factor. Jerome, uh, your viewpoint, uh, more is better, but is there a point at which more stops being better? Yeah, from, from a technical point of view, uh, uh, Pierre already said that the, the first thing is uh, redundancy. Uh, if you have more sensor, you will be able to uh, get the result uh, more robust because you will be able to uh, detect uh, any failure in the, uh, in, in, for the sensor side, but also for the algorithms using the sensor. Uh, so, m m more sensor uh, will be useful for this, uh, that, 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 but we need to keep in mind that it has to be, uh, it has to be com complementary as well, because if you have just uh, tens of lighters and they are just providing the same kind of information, you will not bring any new information uh, to, the, to the, the, the problem to the issue. Uh, so you, you still need to cover a large scale of information to make sure that you can handle any situation or at least detect uh, any situation. So um, yeah, for me it's not, it, it's not a difficulty to embed uh, a lot of sensors, uh, with, but it's, it's more work, it's more uh, development on the algorithm side and and it's more uh, it's it's better for safety for sure okay so yeah Go thanks ahead. so Jerome uh, I agree with uh, Jerome um, however I also uh, agree that we have two type of uh, situation we have a redundancy and the complementarity and uh, redundancy, of course, for some equipment, it's mandatory. So, for instance, the INS solution, uh, we uh, need at least two, maybe three IMUs and INS solution to be sure that we have redundancy. It's exactly the same as in a plane. Uh, it will be the same for any uh, critical component. But regarding the complementarity, it's uh, very interesting, for instance, for our point of view, to be able to fuse both uh, the vision-based odometer as well as the uh, wheel speed information to be able to detect these frequencies and, of course, be able to check if there is any failure. But I am also thinking about uh, vision-based uh, SLAM or vision-based uh, odometry. Um, if you uh, think about difficult weather conditions, for instance, uh, or night conditions, uh, having uh, several uh, cameras that can uh, maybe more focus on low light conditions, high light conditions, infrared cameras, for instance, uh, you can get much more information that will uh, be complement in fact, and will help the overall uh, solution to be able to provide a consistent solution in all situations. So yes, having 
a uh, lot of uh, different sensor is helpful, but of course uh, we should keep in mind that we have to certify all the stuff, we have to qualify all the stuff, so uh, keep it simple, it's always the best uh, solution uh, on a technical point of view, obviously. Exactly. Well, this concludes our webinar. I want to thank uh, all the panelists, Raphael, Jerome, and Pierre. I want to thank our audience for joining us. And uh, I want to especially thank Raphael again as sponsor of this webinar for making it possible. Raphael, any uh, last remarks? Uh, thank you, everybody. I hope uh, this webinar was of interest for you. Uh, and as I said, uh, thank you to all Inside Genesis uh, team for this amazing work. So thanks, everybody, and enjoy the evening, the day, the afternoon, depending on where you are. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And Lori, back to you. Okay, thank you. And just most importantly, thanks again for joining us. It's Lori Dearman saying, hope we see you on the next one. Bye for now.